Reporting for Heart Rhythm TV, I'm Mag Dande, and I'm joined by Dr. Rachel Lampert from Yale University. We're just coming off of the last late-breaking clinical trial session here at HRS 2024. Dr. Lampert, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. It's such a pleasure to be here, Dr. Dande. Of course. The pleasure is ours. Uh, so we're going to be talking about the Live Long QT study, uh, registry data that you just presented. Could you summarize the, the re key results for our audience and, and some of the clinical implications of it? Yes, absolutely. So the overall Live Long QT study was presented last fall and uh, what, the, what that study found was that in the overall cohort of over 1,600 um, patients with Long QT, those who were exercising more vigorously and even competitively did not have a higher rate of arrhythmic events than those who were less vigorous uh, or sedentary. Um, because we know that event rate varies so much in long QT based on genotype, based on age, and based on sex, we really wanted to look at the different subgroups just to make sure that it wasn't that we were having better outcomes in one, worse outcomes in another. And so that's what this, that's what this analysis was about. So we looked at the, basically you get eight different groups, long QT1, long QT2, males, females, and then we looked at less than 13 um, estimating a pre-pubertal uh, group, and then greater than 13 estimating a post-pubertal group. So what we found for the long QT1s, um, among the, the children, basically we only saw events in the young males. Um, they were not statistically different at all between the vigorous and the non-vigorous. There were just three total events in these uh, young boys, and uh, all of the events in, in events occurred in both sedentary and vigorous boys, but they were all like playing tag. So really nobody was having events during vigorous sports um, in that group. And then um, in the older long QT1 patients, for both men and women, um, we did not see events occurring during vigorous exercise. I should say we did. We we saw one uh, one or two uh, in in a single individual that occurred. One playing softball, one playing volleyball. But the vast majority of the events, whether they were habitual exercisers or not, were occurring during activities of daily living, walking the dog, this type of trigger. Um, so that was long QT1. Among the long QT2 patients, um, we saw very few events in the children. Just one girl um, under 13 had an event while she was um, doing something at rest. And then among the adults, um, we saw, only saw events in the women and only in those who had ICDs. Really all the events we're talking about were ICD shocks, so just, just very few arrests. Um, uh, and one, uh, and a, single, a single death in a non-vigorous exerciser. So among the long QT2, um, we saw the, uh, the post-pubertal women were, with ICDs were having events. They were all occurring at rest again. Um, among the vigorous, among the non-vigorous, all the events were at rest, really nothing happening with exercise at all. So we were very pleased that the, the eight subgroups, um, the study was powered, of course, for the entire group of long QT1. So we were not able to look statistically at each of these eight subgroups groups, but really just looking qualitatively, things were very much the same. There was no group standing out to say, this group is different. That's really interesting because we have, uh, you, you've presented a lot of data on this, obviously you're an expert yeah. on the issue, uh, when it comes to allowing uh, long QT patients to participate in exercise and sports and, and even professional athletes, uh, the discussion, is, as you've mentioned multiple times, comes down to risk tolerance and shared decision right. making. Right. So how does this data uh, change your clinical practice when it comes to chatting with your patients about, about their risk of sudden cardiac arrest. So an important part of, sh of the shared decision-making decision conversation is about explaining not only the data to the patient in front of you, but really talking to that patient, are you the same as the person in the trials? Because that really, you know, how can, can we apply that data to you? So the purpose of this sub-analysis and the way the results came out is that really we can now look at any of these different um, subgroups of people, age, gender, et cetera, and, and we can say, you know, based on our sub-analyses, it really looks like you, yourself, would have a similar risk as the entire group. And so it really informs the way we're able to talk about the individual patient about their data, about, I'm sorry, about their risk. Now, you know, I think it's important in that shared decision-making conversation to say, our data don't show in either, in either of the LIVE studies, LIVE Long QT, LIVE HCM, that no one ever has an event during exercise. But really what they show is that if you exercise habitually, your overall risk is not higher than those who don't. And that's really helpful for our patients to put into context their own decisions about 
participation in sports and, and lifestyle in general. Uh, the question of being on appropriate treatment comes up. Uh, we know there's some variation to response to beta blockers, etc. In this registry data, do we have any signal in terms of what happens when someone's not fully treated or what's the ideal treatment? So we were not able to collect as detailed data on compliance as would have been ideal. We do know that of the t there were two um, adolescent young men, one who had long QT1, one who um, had another genotype, who did have a cardiac arrest. And we do know that both of the, those young people were not taking their beta blockers. So we don't have the compliance for the entire group, but I think it really does emphasize the importance of the antiadrenergic treatment for these long QT patients. And we have beta blockers um, are obviously the cornerstone. Um, we do have other options though, and it depends on the genotype, but, but we, uh, we have denervation for people that can't tolerate beta blockers. And so I think um, we do have options, but it's really important to be doing something um, to, treat your, to, 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 treat, to treat your long QT to lower that risk. And circling back to some of the triggers, for the, the post-pubertal female patients, what, might there be an impact of hormones on, on their risk, or is that something that you know, the registry looks at or, or not at this time? Well, so, so um, we, uh, we sort of looked at these different age groups um, as a surrogate, obviously, for um, hormonal levels. I think we didn't look specifically at that question, but we do know that, uh, obviously, that hormones affect the QT and affect the different genotypes in different ways, and that really was the impetus to look at these different subgroups. And thank you for your work, Dr. Lampert, and for your time talking to us today. And thank you so much for your interest in really in how exercise impacts the lives of these, of these young people with long QT. For more coverage of HRS 2024, especially the late-breaking clinical trials, follow us on YouTube.